So uh, welcome to this booth session. Uh, I actually changed the title for this booth session. Uh, originally, the title was High Performance Apache Spark with data with in-memory data grid. But I changed it to, uh, since this uh, conference is all about microservices almost. Everybody talks about microservices, and everybody has to have microservices in the title. So I actually changed the title a bit. So the title today is High Performance Data Storage in a Microservice Environment. So. And I'm going to talk a bit about that as well. What, what, what is it with microservices and, and why, why is it interesting to talk about data storage? Well, if you've been at this conference, you can notice that very few people are actually talking about data storage for microservices because it's one of the hardest problems to solve for microservices. In many cases, what we want to do with microservices for data, uh, is, is, uh, with data is that we want to, for each service we provide, we want to store the data locally in one local uh, how do you put that? You want to put, you want to store data close to the service. Uh, so, giving an example, of how that would look like. For example, this is a uh, an example application that we got called Cool Store, and Cool Store used to be a monolith. But if you want to, we have actually uh, bro broken this up and delivered this as a, as a microservice as well. And if you want to, when you want to bre break this up and build this as a microservice, you have to do certain things. You have to define, for example. What, what are your different services uh, in here? So one of them could, for example, be a product catalog because we have a number of product data coming out here and products uh, showing products on this page. So product catalog is definitely one of the microservices we want to define. Another one would be pricing because pricing would change depending on which locale you have. You might have pricing rules that are advanced depending on taxes, etc. So if you log in, your, 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 your price might change as well. You might have discounts, etc. So, so pricing is, is, is a service in itself. We also have inventory here, a bit hard to see, but inventory shows how many of this uh, is, is left, at least uh, you can still buy, we have in store. So if you wanna, so that would be an inventory, that would be a microservice as well. And on top we also have uh, features like shopping carts and authentication, and these might also be microservices. So I define these a bit like functional microservices. Uh, so we have the product catalog here, inventory service, pricing service. And we also have a, something called a UI service that might be responsible for serving the whole page. Uh, and then we have shopping cart and authentication, etc. On top of that, we probably have another, another set of, of microservices functions that help us do uh, things like full tolerance, etc. But this is not what this talk is about. So for each of these, you would typically have one data store. And when you have one data store for this, Let's say you do uh, Postgres or uh, MuseQL for, for the, the product catalog service here. The problem with that is when you want to scale that, you, you, you typically also have to scale your database layer. So, and that's, that's uh, and, and, and you're kind of still limited. It's better than in the monolith, but you're kind of still limited to how, f how much you can scale your database as well. So that's, that's a perfect use case for, for, um, for Jables data grid actually. So with Jables data grid, Data is, uh, you can, you can, it's a distributed data store that can store data both in memory and on file. And by doing that, we can, we can scale and we can meet performance requirements much better for specific, specifically for microservices. So a bit of explanation of Yable's data grid. So Yable's data grid, as I said, is an in-memory data store. It can be used to accelerate big data analytics as well, but it's also great to use, for example, for microservices storage. So in that case, that would, you would have something perhaps like, like Wildfly Swarm or Spring Booth over here or Yables EAP uh, writing directly to the data grid instead, which is a distributed data grid on, uh, use, running here. We can scale the data grid independently as well from the services. So this becomes like a service layer for our, our uh, microservices that we're building. To, and they can just request more, uh, more space if they want to and, uh, and, and uh, store more data, for example, for their services. So we can grow this as our microservices environment grows. But the good thing about this is that it also provides different layers so we can have, like, we can connect things like Spark or other applications like rule engines, etc., to operate on that data. Uh, also, if we want to, we can do data overflow, etc., to a persistent store. So obviously, in memory, it's, it's good. We can have fault tolerance in memory. So if one service goes down or even one rack goes down, we can still have replicated data in memory. But you might also want to have uh, uh, saved actual data to some file storage as well. So we can do that in data grid as well. Can I ask a question? Yes, sure. Okay. So could you also, would that 
data overflow management, could you also be doing it for Postgres? So not even data overflow, but you're like, I want to keep this in memory, but I also want to write it out. To yes, to exactly. So handle. yeah, so this example is yes, using Cassandra and Red Hat Storage, but we support database here as well. So, so we could overflow data into, into a, a physical database if we want to. Okay, because what I'm thinking is like something, so I've got, with OpenShift I can get a master-slave replicated Postgres. Yeah. But the thing is, I'm always worried about my master overflow. Yeah. So it would, would you recommend a pattern like write to data grid, data grid's writing to the master. Yes. To keep the raster from, it's like almost like a, a, yeah. a circuit breaker. Over the master from overflow. Exactly. So I, I'm going to try to repeat your question just for the audience here okay. as well. Uh, <laughs> so the question is about uh, can we use uh, use data to, to to secure overflow basically from databases, and and yes, one of the configurations we can use for data grid is that we can say that that it's it's going to persist uh, as, as uh, after uh, right behind basically. So it means it's not writing as part of your, your transaction or as part of your initial writing, but it, so it will it will guard against overflowing your data. Database. So it, you get better performance than your database, and you can still kind of it will it will eventually write to the data store. So you might be able to avoid something like Cassandra, which is good for fast writes. Yeah. Because data grid is acting as a buffer layer in front of your Postgres. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And it will be extremely fast for reads, etc. Exactly. So, but one of the problem you'll see, uh, and even in the in a, in, a, in, a, in a distributed uh, in a distributed architecture like this, you would typically it doesn't show in this picture. You will typically have different islands of data. You will have different in instance of, uh, we call them cache instances, different stores in data grid where you store the data. And we'll see examples of this later. So you will have these different stores and, and, and there are, they, are, uh, they, are not, uh, they are not the same stores. So it's basically your, your data becomes islands that are defined by your microservices architecture. So uh, in our example that we had before, that would be that product catalog is one, while inventory is another one, et cetera. So if you want to run a query against both, it's, it's, it's actually hard to do that because you have data in two different data stores. So uh, this talk is about how to unlock your data as well and how, and how to use, for example, Apache Spark to do that. So to get value out of the data that we have in different microservices there, uh, we, we could uh, we could uh, do th things like ETL and other stuff, but ETL has, has limits and it has uh, it, it will affect performance sometimes. And it also the problem is that it's a typical batch. Uh, with Apache Spark, we can actually do both events, but also also uh, do a real time queries here, where we can read up data from the microservices and operate on the data from the microservices, and create, for example, business reporting, telling us uh, with combining data from different microservices in here. So I thought I was going to demonstrate this. So let's see how that would look like. What I've done is I've um, I looked for big data sets. And one of the big data sets available is Stack Overflow, actually. Stack Overflow, you're probably familiar with Stack Overflow. It's a great source for if you're looking for, if you have issues with and, and you want help with certain things on um, programming languages or other things as well. Uh, you, you can, uh, you can pull, pull, put a question in Stack Overflow, and, and there's a big community responding to questions. So uh, so you would have questions here. People would post things up, up here, and you have, but you have to be registered. So we have users, and we have something like a post. If this were implemented with a microservice, which I don't know if it is, it would typically have a user store and a post store. So that's what we want to. Uh, so we, I'm going to use this data. And one one thing is that they actually they pr they are actually publishing the data. I can um, let me show you here. So this is uh, Stack Overflow. Somebody post a question, for example and uh, putting code here and somebody will have an answer. And the good thing is that actually Stack Overflow, they, they store all that data, not only from the, the, the Stack Overflow, actually they, it's, it, this is part of a bigger uh, constellation called Stack Exchange, which has a lot of different groups for, for posting, etc. So we have, we have everything like this. We have a lot of data. We can, you can show us a big data set or a small data set. For this example, I small, chose a small data set, but we actually run this to, with the biggest data set in here, which is, uh, I think it's SIPT 44 gigs data. So that's quite a lot of data. Compressed. Uh, yeah, compressed seven, with seven SIPs. So it's, 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 it's a lot of data when you put it in there. <laughs> that's, that's the Stack Overflow. The Stack Overflow is the biggest one. So, but, uh, and it works, it works great, but, it, but it, it's, it's more than I can run on this laptop. <laughs> uh, so let's get back to the, um, oh, actually let's, um, 
let's look at, a, at the first example here. So what I've done here is we have, oh, I need to just change my, I don't know, I'm not a front-end programmer, I have to say that first, so this that might not look as good as it should be, but technical-wise, it, it will work at least, so hopefully. <laughs> but what, what you see in the bottom here is actually an illustration of the, the data read I'm running. I'm running, currently I'm running three data read processes in here. Those data read processes are running on locally on my, my, on my machine here. So three data read instances, but they could be distributed in a network. They could be running on different, different pods and, and be part of a microservice, um, for example. And what we, so what we have here is we, you can see that it's, it currently it indicates that there's zero entries in each post. And I have a, a set of different caches or stores here. So I have the post store. Yeah, this is exactly. This is the segmented data spaces that we have. So, so posts per posts will be going to the post store. Users will go into the user store. But we still have s nothing here. So the first thing we have to do is to load in data. So I'm, I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna see if I can be quick here and switch back to my window. We're soon gonna see. Now we can see it being populated with data. And that was quite quick, actually. You can see it's it's. I'll, I'm using a small data set here, but for for the for the purpose of demo. And if you calculate that together, you can see that that's somewhere around six thousand entries, a bit more, so six six hundred sixty, something like that. So, uh, and so if you're really good at at, at, uh, at math, you could probably calculate it quite quickly. But <laughs> I'm not as good as just calculating stuff out of, out of the blue. But this, this is the data from the user store. We also have data from the post store. So this would, this would illustrate the data that we have in here from our microservices. So what we want to do now is we want to make use of that data. So one of the things, perhaps, is to, to, to run a query in Apache Spark that would uh, calculate the highest ranking users, the users with the highest reputation, because that's part of that, that's, that Stack Overflow thing, is that when you respond to different things, you get points for that, so you get rank ranking points. And the higher you are, the better you are. And, and that's definitely something they want to promote, so why well, I don't have that on the front page, the highest ranking user, that's, that I, we're missing that, actually. Let's create that. So to do that, uh, what I do is I, I run an Apache Spark query, uh, I can show you the code for this later on as well, but it's, it's actually quite easy. So I hooked up the Apache Spark, and Apache Spark has something called RDDs, and they are resilient distributed data stores. And RDDs, we, we support using, uh, using InfiniSpan or Yables Data Grid as an RDD. So we can, pull up, we can do uh, Spark queries directly against this data. Uh, so what I do is I do Spark data here, and I, I, I have a so when I, when I load the data, I transform them into Java objects. So the Java objects, they have different values, def, the getters and setters. So one of them would be display name, which is the name that the user have. And the other thing is the reputation there. That, that's the data we want to have. We want to select them from users. And we want to order it by reputation. And we want to describe that we want to just have the 10 most. Actually, the interface only shows five, but this, this runs 10. So to run that, yes. To show this is uh, this is the, not the one. This is the highest ranking query. I wonder if this is um, so. This is a bit of more code, as you can see. I I, I create this Java pair RDD. Oops, which uh, which I get from uh, by connecting to data data grid. I run um, uh, I create an SQL context. This is all part of the documentation for S for Apache Spark. And then I, I define the query, and I run the query, and I collect it as a list. But the other thing I want to do is I want to store the result somewhere. I just don't want to print the result to output. That would be boring. So I want to store the result as well. So I actually store the result in another data island called, uh, in this case, it's called highest rank ranking. So if you go back to the demo, we have a data island here called highest ranking analytics store. It doesn't have any data in it right now. So when we run this, it, that's going to populate with data, and then this one can use that data to show. And that's going to be extremely fast, because all that data from that report is just stored in memory in Yables Data Grid. So let's run that. So let's see if I, uh, that should be this. So that's running that Java file you just showed. Yeah, it's actually, what it does, it sends this Java file to a Spark instance, running locally on this machine. 
yeah. So it, it sends it to Spark, and we can see that later on as well, and it executes that in, in Spark. And it's, uh, as you can see, we already have data in here. So if I refresh this browser now, you can see we now have the user ranking in there. So that, that's, that's kind of nice. We can get user ranking uh, quite quickly from that. Let's, let's do a bit more uh, advanced. Actually, I talked about this. We have different di data, data islands. You have a question? Yeah. Yeah, so this, this actually represents that on this particular node in the data grid, we have nine entries. Oh, okay. On this node, we have four, and on this one, we have seven. So, it, it, so, is there, so that adds up to 20? 20. 20. Yeah. So what? We have 10 yeah. We have 10, so and that's because we're actually using, because we have in memory data here, we want to use backup copies of the data. Okay. So, currently, I'm using two, ver two number of owners, two. So, every entry comes in there, becomes basically hands up on one node and another node. So that's the reason we have th that. And the numbers are so low, so we have an un uneven distribution. If you're the higher the number, all the better the distribution are. So, but if you go to the location of, uh, if, if you want to do some more uh, advanced, so one of the things I thought about was I, I want to know what's the most popular location for users that, po that post here. So I want to think, w is, it, is it US users who post it, or is it uh, Swedish users, or, or is it uh, somebody else, some other countries that are more popular? Because we, that might be interesting, but speci specifically if you do targeted advertising in different countries and different regions, you want to find out do we have an effect on that. So we want to know who is actually using this and posting, our, uh, posting these kind of things. But they, their location is stored in the user object. And, uh, and, the, and the posts are, of course, stored in the post store. So I want to count how many, do, uh, how many entries a user uh, does that has a particular, or, and I want to sum it up to the, to the number of, uh, I'm going to group it by the, by, the re, by the location, and then I want to sum it up and, and compare that and, and give that back. So that's something that's actually quite hard to do in Java, but it's something that's actually very easy to do in SQL. We do it a lot of times. We use, oops. So, so with SQL, we would use something called IniJoin, so we would use any join between two different data stores here. So I use both post data store, which is one of the data islands from the data grid, and that doesn't even have to be in the same data grid. It could be on different data grid, different nodes, just hooking up how Spark is talking to data grid. So we have posts on one data grid, and we have uh, users uh, is another one. And, and then we do an, an inner join here from the user, uh, from the user to the posts. Uh, and we do it on by, by comparing IDs. So we know that uh, ID from the user ID to the owner ID of the post. And then we look, um, uh, we also do it for a certain type because only what certain times are the actual posts. Uh, and then we have, we group them by the location and then we order it by, that, by the location or by post actually. And we describe, and then we, and we, we limit it to, um, to 10 entries. Yeah, it does. Like the dude where you have to learn pig and some other yeah. crazy language. Exactly. Uh, the comment here was that that's, it looks very much like normal SQL or something. You, right. it, you don't have to learn mm -hmm. as, as another thing. It's, it's pure SQL. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not sure which version, but it's some ANSI SQL, I think, right. with, with based on that. So let's, uh, let's run that query, see. And that should be run uh, location query. So now. We should see data coming in the location store. That's going to take a bit longer to run. But if the, the nice thing is I run this against uh, the, uh, this data set. It's only like a couple of thousand here and a couple of thousand there. And it still takes a bit of time to run it. But I run this against the, the big database where we have 44 gigs of posts uh, or even more. And it was actually, I think it was uh, 300 million posts in there and, uh, and, and something like two or three million users. And it took roughly the same time to run as it takes here. On a big, on a big uh, data screen, grid machine. I'll talk more about that later on. So now we have data here. So now, if I reload, you can see the pie shot. So somebody said, no, "Do not use pie shot." And, <laughs> and to be honest, I'm I'm not a good front end developer. So as you can see, it is a bit hard to see. But it turns out that actually the data here is kind of dirty. A lot of people don't have location in there, so it's a lot of people have undefined here. And then we have Singapore, it says here, uh, before United States, actually. 
And the reason for that is actually that the data set I'm using is kind of, it, it was from a smaller data set. I showed you the list of that. And I, I like to brew beers at home. So I, I took one, one of the forums here is about home brewing beers and how you do and how, how you reach certain types of, of, of uh, bitterness, etc., in beers, etc. So, so I thought, what else can I do? What is more, but, and what is even more powerful here? Well, one of the things you can do is like, we can use MapReduce in Apache Spark. So I wanted to use MapReduce, and I wanted to use MapReduce to actually see which is the more, most popular type of beer discussed on this. So uh, we, I, I defined a sort of keywords. In this case, it was ale, stout, pay, EPA, uh, lager. And, and, I, and I wanted to run that keyword settings against the data set to see. So what it will actually do, it will go into the body of the post, and it will break up the body into different words. By, by separating it by space. And if these words are equal to one of the keywords, we're gonna, we're gonna store that in another RDD. And we're then gonna use that to, to map that, and then we're gonna reduce that to calculate what's the most popular thing to do. That's a rather complex thing, and, and uh, we're not gonna spend too much time looking at the code. Uh, but in essence, what we do, as I said here, we, the first thing we do is we map to words, and then we map it to pair, meaning word and an, an integer, so we can count it, but we haven't counted it yet. And then we reduce it by counting how often these words occurred. So, so we're mapping it into different data stores here. And, and then we store that again, and we sto will store that in the, in the, we should store that in the keyword analytics store here, which is empty now. So let's run that. Oh, I got an exception. Uh, actually, that's an exception while, while it's, while it's sort of sending messages back from the Spark server to me. So it's, I don't really have to care about that exception. It's not. So, um, keyword map reduce, yeah. So let's run that. So that's going to send, again, it sends a, actually a fat yarn. It sends up to Spark, and Spark's going to execute that. And it's already done, actually. So that was fast. So now we have data in there. And now, from that data, I've calculated what's the most popular type of beer. So ale seems to be the most popular type of beer with something like 250 occurrence or 220 occurrence, then IPA and then lager and then stout. But so, <laughs> so, uh, uh, so that that's, that's basically concludes the demo, but it's kind of, it, it's, it's nice and it's powerful. Uh, so let's go back to the presentation. So, and repeat a bit what, what we did here. So what we did here was we had data in two different data stores, one post store and one user store, which could be microservices types of stores then. And then we used different, different, uh, different things like high, highest reputation, different, different queries through Spark and stored that back into a data grid again. That could be stored back into a database if you want to or to something else. Anything that Spark actually connects to it and writes to, you could connect it to. But you can write it back into to InfiniSpan here. Uh, you could also use something like Zeppelin on top of this, so which shows nice graphs, etc. Uh, but I'll, I chose to implement my, uh, implement it myself. But uh, so this is how it looks like. As I mentioned before, this is a distributed cache with two owners. That's um, what we have here. So at scale, how would this look like? Well, we I run this in a in our central lab in, uh, that we have, and in a lab environment. We have quite kind of well, a very large service actually. I have a couple of servers with about 150 gigabytes of memory in them. So I started up a couple of those. I think it was five of them. And uh, I loaded the, the big data set in here. So now we're talking uh, something like over, zip, over, over, over 50 gig of zip data actually. Um, in, in the whole data set in RAM now. Yes. And I wanted that because I wanted the speed of that. But I could do, I could say that I only store 10% of that in RAM and, and other in an, an external data store. But since I want the speed for, for doing Spark executions, I had to do that. And then I defined also that I, that I wanted the Spark worker on each of these machines so that I could quickly connect to the data and, and I could run the data in distributed mode on Spark as well. So this way, with a big data setup, I got approximately the same performance I got here. The, the most heavy query, with the, which compares to those dead two data, it took a couple of seconds to run. But it's uh, so that's that, that's really powerful for to use, for example. So it gives us very good data. So 
Before I leave, well, before we we we, uh, we leave here today, any more questions around this? So yep. Why would I? So you say that Spark can talk to a database. Spark can talk to Cassandra. Spark. Yeah. Why would I want JBoss Data Grid or Infinite Span? Why yeah. Would I, what's the advantage of having that in between? So there, there, yeah. So. The first, the first reason is why, why, and in this case, it was because we were using the, the, the we were using Jables Data Grid as a microservices store. Okay. So uh, we, we wanted data from that. So that, that was one of the things where, that that we could use it for. But the other reason is, is of course, that in in large data sets, especially if you're using something like file based, like Hadoop or like a backend storage for the RDDs, the resilient distributed uh, d uh, data stores. Uh, then it will mean uh, that, that query will run kind of slow, actually, and so with a large data set. It will, it would, it would still be fast. You can distribute it uh, to many, many nodes, but it's it, compared to running it to in memory. We're talking about a, a big, big performance. I haven't done any real performance uh, comparison yet. We are looking to do, looking into do that, but we should see uh, in a factor of 10 to 100 times faster using it in memory. Yep. But then the big data person can actually interrogate that same data using Spark, mm -hmm. right? Like you don't have the Java developer doesn't have to learn how to write Spark. Yep. They, they can just write JMS or whatever they want to write into, yeah. the, into the data grid. That's a, that's a very good point. Uh, exactly. So 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 one of the one, the question here was uh, actually statement more well, was actually that that the good thing is that that Java developers can use what they're used to. That they, they could they could write things into a GMS queue or something like that that ends up on data grid. And then we could we could use Spark uh, to to do that. So that means that 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 the people responsible for creating these reports that are knowledgeable about Spark doesn't have to know about GMS and all that, and the Java developers doesn't know, have to know about Spark. That's hundred percent correct. So it layers at that, that level. Cool. Any other questions? Okay. Then that concludes my demo. Thank you very much. <laughs>